very good night to you, uh, Dr. Pranjpe. I think we are on the marathon. Thank you. All the best. Thank you. More power to you. Bye bye. Bye. Let me remove you from the spotlight so that uh, we can carry on. I know the tech team needs some rest, but there is no rest for the weary. We have to chug along. And you know, the whole idea of this conference was to um, create that energy from our side. You know, we didn't want to sit on the sidelines and watch a hate fest or um, an intersectionality uh, of hate and, and you know, um, bullying and, you know, false uh, narratives. And so we created this platform. And I think uh, our, our thought leaders have respected, uh, you know, the need of the hour and have come to support us. So we've had like two days of wonderful panelists. And um, I'm going to invite next two very well-known speakers and narrative um, proponents in our community. Um, one is Mr. Vibhuti Jha, no stranger to us, and um, Mr. Sanjay Dikshit Ji. I don't see him, but I'm going to... Vibhuti Ji, namaste. My yeah, video is unmute. Namaste. Welcome. Myself. Namaste. Thank you very much. Thank you. Do we see uh, Sanjay Shiji? If if he must be doing his ask me anything session of his. Oh, so, so if that is the session on. So please just ping him. Time to arrive here. All oh, right. <laughs> We are all marathon runners, right? We we tug along. We keep we keep it going. That's right. So Sanjay Dixit. Do you mind pinging him? I have a broken phone, so sometimes it doesn't do what it has to do. Okay, I, I'll try. I'll charge you the fee for that, but then that will be. <laughs> We will settle our accounts <laughs> later. We always do, don't we? <laughs> uh. He's not taking the phone. I'm going to send him a message. Mm -hmm. I think that works. Um, I'm sure he'll join us in a little bit. This was the slot um, I think he, he was comfortable with. So, Radhi Vermont, if you also keep a lookout and if Santiji joins, please let us know. And we will meanwhile begin. We have a lot yeah, to talk sure. about. I'm watching, but yeah, you can continue with the. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sure, go ahead. Will do. So, um, thank you, Vibhuti ji, for all your support. And I see Sanjay ji is here too. There we are. Sanjay namaste pronounced. And thank you both for being here. It's just such a such an honor and such a pleasure. You know, um, I'm just so glad this conference came together the way it did. You know, we. Like I said, wanted to create that energy and Sanjay ji, you and Vibhuti ji, you both do this every single day, um, helping us keep our, um, you know, narrative uh, and our, you know, minds clear about what, what is going on in this world. So I think without further ado, I'll do a quick introduction. Um, Jaipur Dialogues is a media partner anyway with this conference and it, this show is live on Jaipur Dialogues. And Vibhuti Ji and Sanjay Dikshit Ji both host, um, you know, almost there's a daily um, session uh, on, on Jaipur Dialogues uh, discussing 
um, all of our issues and are uh, you know answering. I I think you just finished a session on ask me anything, so oh, yes. a lot of issues, <laughs> right? A lot of issues are brought out, everything under the sun. And um, Sanjay Dikshiji is an ex um, IS officer, which is a 1986 batch, and and Vibhuti ji is from the RBI, so they they know Indian institutions in and out. So we can really ask them anything. And uh, we, you know your your book Sanjay ji on Unbreaking India has been so popular and really inspired all of us. Thank you. Uh, yes. Um, so um, I will sort of start with just asking you, um, I think both of you can take a couple of minutes to answer this. I think we are living in very unusual times. You know, this conference was organized around 9-11 for very specific reasons, given that there is this Hindu phobic conference going on. And we also wanted to create our own narrative. And um, the geopolitics of 9-11 is not lost upon us. You know, the fact that in US faced that terror attack and today after 20 years, we are almost back to pavilion. You know, Taliban that was recognized as a ter uh, terrorist um, group in uh, 2001. Today, there's a lot of uh, effort to legitimize it. So my first question is a very sort of geopolitical one. And Sanjiji, maybe I'll go to you first and get your views on how you think this whole situation is playing out? Well, uh, it's very interesting. You know, people used to say that uh, uh, most countries, or in fact, all the countries have an army. And in Pakistan, the army has a country. And now here is a situation where terrorists have a country, no less. So that's um, going one better <laughs> on whatever you have had right. in the past. So. <laughs> Uh, this is uh, really uh, standing the entire uh, geopolitics of the world on its head. Uh, I think uh, United Nations, uh, when it was formed, probably did not uh, uh, bargain for this kind of a situation. But that's what we have today. And uh, definitely we need uh, a very, very new and fresh approach towards it. The conventional geopolitical tools have not worked. And the one reason, the one very important reason why they haven't worked is because the West and uh, all the people or all the countries who believe in the Western values or who follow the Western values almost unquestioningly, and I would put India among one of them, they are not ready to confront the elephant in the room. They are not ready to confront the ideology. So they are talking about terrorists, they are talking about Taliban, they are talking about various other uh, facets of Taliban or various other, uh, I should say, uh, forms of Taliban. But they are not talking about the ideology that actually proliferates these people. And uh, you crush one and the another one uh, just comes up, you know, kind of Rakta Beach syndrome. I think most people here would have heard of Rakta Beach. So uh, the political correctness, the unwillingness to confront the ideology at its roots, that is something that is going to lead to further disasters, not only in the West, also in uh, the in neighborhood, because uh, we seem to be uh, overtaken by that same kind of political correctness as well. And uh, mind you, uh, I have a uh, I, I can quote uh, hundreds of uh, examples from history when exactly these kind of things have been done and then exactly the same results have been seen. And that's what I think, uh, who was it? I think it was Einstein who said that uh, 
uh, repeating the same thing over and over and expecting different results is insanity. So I think that's what it is. I think the um, foreign minister of uh, UAE, uh, the younger one, the younger one to the crown prince, one of the Nayans, uh, he was answering this question in Saudi Arabia when somebody asked him that um, how does he look at uh, this situation, the terror situation in the West. And then he, he was talking in Arabic till that time, but they did not realize that he was actually Western educated. So he uh, promptly changed tone and he said that, okay, I will speak to you in English. Somebody said, okay, we have translations. Because you know, I speak to you in English so that you get it exactly right. And what did he say? Say that, okay, as long as the West thinks that they know Islam better than us and they know these people better than us and as long as they are politically correct, the problem of terror is going to increase. And I absolutely endorse it. Those are my opening comments. Thank you, Sanjiji. Yeah, that was powerful. I remember that seeing that video uh, of that crown prince, or not a crown prince, but one of the... Uh, he's, he's the he's younger, younger brother of the crown prince. Yeah. Younger brother, probably, yes. And yeah, that that was, yeah, really well framed that. And, and uh, um, you know, Vibhuti Ji, I'll go straight to you. And you live in the United States, and also you're a financial, you know, uh, you have your own firm. And you uh, live in New York. And, you know, I mean, it's palpable. I I used to live in in that area area for a long time, especially when 9/11 happened, and you know that day can never leave us. You know that day is in my mind, in my head, and we always remember where we were. You know, and how the world changed right after. Um, so, how do you see this? You know that we are almost back to square one, and sort of the ineptitude of the Joe Biden government, and just how things are shaping up. Are you on mute, sir? Still on mute. I unmuted myself. You muted me back. Oh, anyway. I'm sorry. I'm... <laughs> this, is how, this, is how, this is how the globe operates. I want to talk, but you shut me up. You know? <laughs> Having said that, Sanjay Ji has straightway stepped on from his program, Ask Me Anything, you ask him another one, and he's in, in a role. So perfectly agree with that uh, assessment of this gentleman, UAE foreign minister or whatever prince it was. Today, I just tweeted actually just before the program began, Wall Street Journal has written an article that after 20 years of this uh, World, Trade, World Trade Center fiasco, disaster, tragedy, Wall Street Journal is asking and writing an article talking about an Iowa Muslim family. How are you coping up with this? And I tweeted that you, I, you guys are asking a group of people, how are they coping with this? What, was a, what about asking us, how are we coping with that? You know, instead of trying to appease and pander and trying to bring an inclusive agenda, that's where the West goes wrong. And the UAE foreign minister or whatever prince he was, he said it correctly. Where is the West and the democratic country demanding reciprocity from the Islamic world? I also said in my tweet that have you tried to figure out that it's their Sharia beliefs which is not letting them imbibe in our society and merge with our society in the new world. Here also they want Sharia. And they are recognizing that Sharia influence will increase. Now, there's a very interesting point here. The Islamic agenda is split into four certain groups. You have ISIS, Al-Qaeda, and Taliban. They form the extremist groups who are doing everything in the name of Sharia. But you have a group of people among the Islams. They say, oh, they are not actually Muslims. They are not following Sharia. But that's, that's totally false. They are following Sharia. They are bringing Sharia rule. 
what is, so what is the story of this group of people? They say, we represent the Sharia. We are the all-inclusive. We are the peaceful. But you don't agree with me, you are a kafir. You are a non-believer. I have the right to slit your throat. That's the second group, which forms into care and other institutions that speak for Islam as the West has misunderstood it. So when the Islamic Center, which is opened in New York, was being set up, you know, I had told them, why don't you go and set up an Islamic Center in Middle East countries where you teach them what democratic life is all about? Instead of trying to teach us, you are already here. You are living a good life. But nobody talks about that. You see how the steps, how somebody is taking advantage of that. Third one is a group of the intellectuals who on CNN and other forums will tell the West, lecture the West, that those guys are primitive guys. They have not grown beyond a particular shape and size. You must concede and give them a lot more to make them feel inclusive. That's the third one. And the fourth one is the hijab wearing, the beard uh, spouting, the even more rabid Islamists who are working in mom and pop shops or Walmart or here or there, I'm not accusing, who will also now become, they also follow the Sharia principle. Here in Port Washington, I'll tell you, this is a real story. Port Washington railway station, okay? The, the ownership of the, the, of the newspaper stall is an Indian Muslim guy. Husband and wife shared their time, time there, one in the morning, other in the evening. The wife was such a wonderful woman until a time. She was wearing saris, she would not cover her hair, but one fine day she was wearing hijab, covering her hair. I said, what happened? We have to revert to our original self, was her answer. My question, my submission here is, we have to understand the beast we are dealing with. I say beast as an, as a, as a, as an opponent, not the beast as an animal. But you have to understand the nature of the beast to be able to deal with them in the manner that it deserves. You are totally right. We have gone back 20 years in time. Taliban is back in power. Pakistani people are opening stores. <laughs> all, the, all, the, all the goods that have come about. New oh, yes. business opportunity has started there, right? <laughs> Malik <laughs> right. So now this is, this is the scenario. We are confronting, we are confronted with a scenario where we know what we need to know. We know where those shelter countries are, the countries where all the terrorism has grown and prospered beyond a particular point in time. That's Pakistan. What has the West done about it? I will leave this, stop with this. Thank you. No, that's ex excellent. You know, it's just an excellent overview of just what we are dealing with. And the fact that, you know, the Joe Biden government may very soon probably recognize the Taliban government is, is, is the imminent threat at this time that the world is even, I think the NATO allies are probably not going to agree to that. Um, but who knows, you know, who knows? We live in very unusual times and uh, anything can happen is, is the way, you know, when, when the Taliban was trying to take over Kabul, I said, no, no, no one will ever allow that. But of course we were all proven wrong. So um, I guess I do want to shift gears a little bit, you know, and, and talk about um, talk about uh, some of the issues that are facing us as Hindus, you know. Two things. One is um, to segue into how there is this whole narrative, you know, that is going on on social media. And, um, and you know, the propaganda systems, as we have seen, you know, based on all the analysis that Sanjay Dikshiji and Vibhutiji, you do on, on, on history that it is possible if for a generation or two, you keep rubbing the same facts on and on and on, the Goebbels propaganda does take roots. And only now we have started to sort of, you know, remove those cobwebs and look at things uh, uh, in detail. But now there is this whole propaganda against Hindu, Hindu, Hinduism, Hindu, you know, from all angles, academia, media, you know, uh, it's of course institutionally um, sort of embedded since many years. And now that we are trying to sort of even have some voice through social media or other platforms, there's this threat of labeling us 
you know, Taliban is equal to, I don't know, Hindutva or something like that. Or I, I heard some strange comments like that. So I want to, uh, and of course, this conference, you know, I think this is the only platform where we are talking about this conference uh, with, with the two of you. The rest of the topics have been very, you know, we were like, we don't want to talk about it. But now that you might have seen some clippings from what they have been talking at this conference, I want to talk about or have both of you talk about that, you know? What do you think, how, where is this going and how, how can we counter? And, you know, what should we do? I guess, Sanjiji, I'll go back to you then. Oh, well, I got into this issue a long time back when Chashi Tharoor had first come up with this idea of Hindu Pakistan. I think almost three years back, I think. That is the time that he had uh, written that book, uh, why I am a Hindu or something. And at that time, Sangam talks, uh, they asked me to do a rejoinder and they asked me, uh, what is the topic that you're going to choose? And I said, I will speak on Hindu Pakistan. And I spoke on Hindu Pakistan. And I said that Hindu Pakistan is a damn good idea. <laughs> right. And, uh, I saw that. <laughs> and <laughs> and yes. the audience was quite scandalized. Uh, but then uh, I kind of explained it. And I said that, uh, what is Pakistan after all? Why Pakistan is bad? And you consider uh, Pakistan to be bad because the fundamentals are bad. That uh, they are actually exemplifying and they're exalting some very, very bad fundamentals where, uh, which are inherently barbaric and which have actually no place in the modern world. That is modern world. When we say modern world, basically, we agree to the Western universalism model of that. I think uh, as uh, Indians, as Hindus, we might also have a lot of issues with that Western universalistic model. But then by and large, we are OK with it. Uh, so I'll just stick to that model and not going into the nuances, because that might complicate things a little bit. And uh, then I said that uh, the if Hindus make a Pakistan, they will, of course, make it according to their fundamentals. They are not going to make according to the Islamic fundamentals that uh, the Pakistan has based its uh, state upon. And when they make it according to their great fundamentals of uh, all the Mahavakyas and uh, all the Shastras and all the universalistic values which we have always had and which West has had to invent now, only 300, 400 years back. So with all that, we will make a great Hindu Pakistan. And uh, of course, nobody uh, could count to that much. Uh, and uh, when they say Hindu Taliban, I put the same argument. I mean, the Hindu Taliban, possibly, if you have a Hindu Taliban, of course, there's no Sharia as far as Hindus are concerned. So if you have a Hindu Taliban rule, the um, non-Hindus cannot possibly be made into zimis because uh, there is no such doctrine here. They, you, they cannot possibly have their um, uh, places of worship broken because uh, the rights of uh, Allah do not apply as rights of, uh, say, Rama or Krishna or even Brahma for that matter. The space of rights and duties uh, works very differently. In fact, uh, in uh, if you go by the Bhagavad Gita, you will find that uh, Krishna, Bhagavan Krishna himself, he places a lot of duties on himself. If somebody worships him, then he's obliged to worship the person back. So the Ishwar, the Ishta, the Devatas, they have concomitant duties here. Whereas if you analyze Islam deeply, which very few people do, 
I hear a lot of people just uh, talking about Islamic verses or Quranic verses and quote a hadith here and there. The basic, the fundamental of uh, uh, Islam is that the, there is a hierarchy of rights there that you must understand very clearly. And that comes when you actually study a few tafsir here and there. Just reading the Quran and just reading the hadith and just reading some fiqh literature doesn't help. A basic fundamental is that the rights in an Islamic situation are graded in a hierarchy. And number one are the rights of Allah. And those rights are very clear. So it can be many, but basically three rights. And three rights are right to be worshipped alone. Okay. No partners. It's, it's actually always baffles me. How can uh, uh, God Almighty uh, think of anyone else becoming a partner? And anyone else, if he is a God Almighty, he doesn't have to feel that insecure. But that's what it is. The fundamental is that the right to be worshipped unequivocally. Then, right to have you as a slave and right to inspire fear. You must fear. You must act as a slave. What is Abdullah, the most popular name? Abdullah means slave of Allah. That's the most popular Arabic name. Wow. Then, uh, uh, of course, that. Uh, and all the temple breaking, all the uh, other actions, uh, plundering, rape, everything, what happens is because of that first right. But uh, in a Hindu Taliban, we have no such rights. The gods have mostly, they have concomitant duties. Just as, right. uh, just they as the, the Hindu dharma is primarily a uh, duty-based uh, 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 duty-based system rather than a rights-based system, which our constitution completely lost sight of. And because of that confusion, we have a lot of problems these days. And when you see all these, uh, what you call a green, white, uh, red axis threatening us, and that is coming from exactly that kind of situation where we haven't asserted the duties at par with the rights. After all, how old are the rights? I think we've discussed with Vibhuti Ji. The whole this rights-based situation, they're talking about the uh, talk of universal rights, uh, basically a principle of science, the mechanistic universe coming from Descartes. It is from the Cartesian universe, which Newton took upon himself. And then Newton's mechanistic universe ultimately inspired the social scientists people like Voltaire, Rousseau, and others, even somebody as racist as Hegel, to talk about these uh, universal rights, individual rights, basically. And this individual rights, well, I often ask, OK, what about the basis? The foundation has been uh, thrown out by the uh, Einsteinian theory of uh, relative uh, <clears throat> relativity and uh, by quantum mechanics. You know, quantum mechanics has actually propounded something which is very much in harmony with the harmony principle of uh, Hinduism. Right. But then rights seem to be getting more and more sharper, more and more starker. So a complete intellectual failure of all the great intellectuals of the world, actually. So in Hinduism, we see that synthesis. We should assert, we should assert that we are in tune with science much more than these uh, people, these uh, red characters spouting all kinds of rights, dogmas, and the, the natural affinity between the three dogmas is uh, only to be expected. I, I am not surprised at all that it should happen. So I think it's all right. I think, I think, I think that that's where it's a whole narrative has to be fought at a very intellectual level. And uh, we need to have uh, the scientists with us uh, because 
they are the only ones right now. I have, I'm sorry, there may be people here from the social science stream, but uh, I do not see people from the social sciences making much headway into that. We need to take people from pure sciences to advocate our cause. Absolutely. So yeah, and you know, uh, dharmic principles are so in tune, like you said, Carl, you know, Carl Sagan and I think uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson have acknowledged that ancient Indian texts actually accurately predict predict all of the findings that they are making these days, you know, the, the, what the distance between the earth and the sun, blah, blah, whatever. So th th those are already known principles in the dharmic uh, society. Of well, I'm, society. I'm, I'm, I'm again at a fundamental level. I'm not talking about these these are all what I call manifestations or uh, symptoms. Right. Right. Even at a fundamental le le level. Uh, and uh, Vibhutiji, uh, coming to you, you know, I want to ask you a little bit. I mean, of course, the same framework, but also the fact that we are here facing the global, uh, you know, the, the co concept of the global Hindutva, first of all. You know, to me, I was very shocked when I even heard of that. I was like, just because we have been countering, do you think that is why? We've countered all of the narratives that happen in the political city councils. We're, we're countering it in the education system now and all of that. So that, is, is, that has made us into this whole, um, made, brought out this concept of global Hindutva and this con conference, right? So I want to know your thought on that and, you know, just just how how do you feel about that and um, the path forward, you know, in terms of how we, we are shaping up as a society, global society? Uh, the whole concept, the attack on Hindutva wouldn't have, wouldn't have happened, but for certain people who are driven to do that. So, you know, they are driven to do that. It does originate, majority of it, from the Abrahamic faith. We are the most peaceful country, peaceful country in the world. We are the most peace-loving people in the world. Show me a country, evidence, where Hindus are a law and order problem, anywhere in the world. We are not. So the question is, when and Audrey Trushke talked about, to understand the power and threat of Hindutva, which power and what threat is what the question came to my mind. And as Sanjayji was pointing out amongst various things, we have discussed these issues in depth and very happy to share with the new audience that we have here, is that we have to understand what we call the element of Purupaksh, which I always say in the modern language is understanding the nature of the beast. Who am I dealing with? So you are to we are talking about Aman Ki Asha, inclusiveness, enlightened moderation, we are doing everything in our power to bring them part of this process, but they don't want to. You know, this is the this is the drift, this is the challenge which the rest of the world faces. The absolute dogma and dogmatic insistence on their way or the highway. So you and I fall into the category of if you don't believe in us, go to the highway. You are out. And that's what is happening. Now, what has happened again is a very important thing is that what I notice is that how beautifully Islam has won. Terrorists have won the PR war. Think yeah. about it. They have won the PR war. Islam, Taliban is institutionalized. United States spokesman said, oh, they were so professional and businesslike in negotiating in release of prisoners. Can there be anything more shameful than that? You know, this is what the West is not realizing. This is what people like us must talk about. That when they instrumentalize religious bigotry in this fashion, that I will not let you do whatever you want because I don't believe in it, that kind of a dictum hates you. Now, remember one thing, many people do not know. There is a Geneva Convention about treatment of prisoners of war, right? There is Geneva Convention that drives how the prisoner of war has to be treated. They don't ac accept that. They actually have a manual which justifies how to kill the hostage in a particular manner. Where is the world talking about it right now? What I say is that 
the world is bending backwards to accommodate a belligerent religion while we are the ones who are attacked as the evil on 9-11. It must boil the blood of every Hindu. I dare say Hindu. I use the word Hindu here. It must boil the blood of every Hindu that this kind of a baloney, this kind of a blasphemy must stop against us. And I'm seeing that happen. There's a tremendous amount of energy happening on this account. So the point which I'm trying to say is that, look at the terrorist bases, which are the countries, which are the base for all terrorists. Pakistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan border. You have Southern and Western Afghanistan, Saudi Arabia, Yemen, Somalia, Kenya, Nigeria, and now European cities, <laughs> yeah. right? These are the home. These have become the new bases of Islamic terrorism. What is the world doing? And we are being accused of being a threat uh, to the world peace. What have we done to deserve that? This must anger every Hindu. And that's what the point which I'm trying to drive without taking too much time now, is that if the West, if India doesn't declare Pakistan, we have to do things on our own. We have to do things on our own. We can't rely upon people. So if Pakistan gets away with blue murder against the United States, what are we waiting for approval from others to declare Pakistan a terrorist state? What are we afraid of, right? There are things that we need to do ourselves. And that's where I will stop that, you know, there is no moderate Muslim. There are only pretenders to the moderation. That's the which I look at. So long as you believe in Sharia, 90% of the Afghanis believe in Sharia. So what are you running away from? Other 99. Than 99. So what are you running away from? You know, that's the issue that is very important for the world to recognize. And if we don't recognize it, then we have a problem. That's the point which I'm trying to say. If we don't recognize the problem, then we have a problem. And that's mm -hmm. part of the thing which, uh, you know, I was listening to Makran Paranjpe's conversation as well. I do not agree with a whole lot of things that he said about uh, English and Sanskrit, but whatever it is. But I would say that you have to understand who you are dealing with. Right. I'd say the double speak and the fact that the PR machinery has really helped to, you know, sugarcoat and, you know, gloss over a lot of things that have happened, um, except for, you know, channels like Chamber Dialogues and, uh, you know, some of the conferences like ours, no one is talking about it. Maybe Fox News is, and you know, that has been labeled um, in its own genre, so to speak, because mm -hmm. mainstream has been captured by this sort of narrative that is a PR machinery for all of these acts. And, you know, right now, I personally think the bigger threat is the fact that they're capturing the United States institution, you know, in an, it's one institution by the other, you know, whether it's the educational, whether the, even the judiciary, the CIA or whatever, you know, they, they really have their networks deep into it. And uh, uh, I mean, Joe Biden. Richard, if I may just interrupt you here with your question, but that's very important. Soon after 9-11, those who know me know the story. I had a one-on-one -on -one conversation with someone, you know, call him a Muslim at this point in time, but I won't say name and origin of his country. He told me soon after 9-11 that we are going to hit every democracy with everything that they are proud of. Your rule of law, your freedom of religion, every concept democratic tool uh, practices that you have, we are going to hit you hard on those because not one Islamic country has the military strength the physical capability or the resources to fight a conventional war against any non-Islamic country. But we can do terror, right? How many Marines would you send to protect a John Doe, right? We will put you, we'll send you back home with your tails between your legs. Actual conversation, I'm not making it up. Those who know me, they know me. I've shared this with certain council generals here. That what are you doing? What are you doing about this mindset? The point which I'm trying to say here is that they are hitting at every single institution. That's what you are alluding to. And they found if we hit the United States and it succumbs in the names of freedom of speech and expression and whatever else, we got the world. It's like saying, as you and I know, if you succeeded in New York, that you can succeed anywhere, right? Isn't it? 
If you could drive in Kolkata, you can drive anywhere in the world, right? So that's what the issue <laughs> is. That you've got United States, the whole world you have conquered and they are succeeding. So here is one more example, Richardi. Georgia runoff election that happened. Ilhan Omar and Talai, members of Congress, they went there on record saying that uh, it is called upon to all, Allah has called upon all Muslims to vote Democratic Party. And I said, if a Hindu organization, Kona or Hindu Students Council or any association of Indians had said, we must vote X person or X party, we would have been chastised, right? That's the issue that we need to contest with. America is in the grip of an apology shame of its own because of their failures and because of their dilemmas. Thank you. Thank you. And yeah, you know, Joe Biden, like I was going to just say that, you know, they are probably if they recognize the Talibani government, first of all, they are the terrorists. And one of the ministers I heard from uh, is of Haqqani Network, which is a known terrorist organization. So that is the level of, uh, you know, so from it is definitely a victory, like you said, for the, uh, you know, is the, the Islamic groups. And the economists just pointed out that there is, uh, you know, sweets being uh, sweets and fireworks in Yemen and Somalia and of course Afghanistan, Pakistan and India and everywhere among these communities are talking about how they have won in Afghanistan. But I think I wanna switch gears and um, I wanna ask about a couple of things. You know, I think one important question that I think this conference definitely begs to be answered and I cannot find you know a, a better forum than what we have right now with uh, both of you. Um, the fact that you know the Hindu civilization sort of by accident you know survived the um, you know the onslaught that happened uh, by Christianity, Islam and communism. Rest of the world is covered by these three forces which we are calling the red, white, and green, right? Now, um, is this conference that happened, right? The, the global in the third dismantling, whatever, it, I think it, it is a sign that there are people who really view this as a threat of resurgence or a renaissance of the civilization that probably was a Sanatani civilization across the world, you know. We see swastika even in the Native Americans, you know, they call it something else, but it's the same symbol. We see it in Nordic civilizations, in the Gaul civilizations, everywhere. So what I'm trying to ask here uh, is a slightly complex question that the civilizational con construct, you know, um, is what, what they are afraid of to some extent, and I want your views on that. And, you know, for example, one of their topics was healthcare. You know, to me, that is a big, big point of concern that they are concerned about indigenous medicines, you know, or uh, even the way the Indian pharma industry functions a lot on generics or, you know, less on patents. And so I don't know if there is any of these points that, um, you know, you would like to take upon and answer as to what are the threats that Hinduism or Hindutva or in the Indic civilization um, brings forth, uh, you know, in these areas or any other. Sanjayji, it's, I think, something you should well, start let, with. Let me put it in the context of the United States, because the problem of United States uh, is the main problem, but the underlying fundamental problem in the United States is that in a the institutions are in a state of capture by the left. In fact, uh, the biggest wonderment is that the left, or the uh, if you look at the all the uh, what is called the narrative setting is concerned, it no longer exists in the so-called communist state. There's only so-called communist state is China. There's not, no theory, and. and uh, nothing coming from uh, China or the Soviet Union, the erstwhile communist state, or any of these surviving communist states. Nothing coming from there. Everything is coming from the West, from the United States, from France, from Germany, from, yeah. uh, from the UK. All the narrative settings, you know, starting from the 50s or late 50s or 60s, as you start with the 
Saul Alinsky's rules or radicals, or you go to postmodernism, or you uh, go to the subalterns, subaltern theories, or uh, whatever latest the woke theories that you have, which is the other extreme. Everything is coming from the West, principally the United States. And mm -hmm. What that has resulted in is that uh, it has uh, resulted in such great peer pressure over everybody that uh, in the United States, people are afraid to speak. They just cannot speak the truth from the fear of being labeled. And that is now even reaching the workplace. People are being branded and they are getting thrown out of the job because they have earned some negative brand. So that, according to me, is a situation of uh, something like an Orwellian situation. It's a 1984-like situation where you have thought police working over time. And that <laughs> the irony, the supreme irony is that the 1984 was written for the Soviet Union. <laughs> and uh, the lens is reversed and it is happening in the United States. And in that kind of an environment, the other one, of course, you have a left Islam embrace right now here, then the, 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 the green finds it very easy to operate because uh, it is learning the tricks of trade from the left. It is uh, watching what is going on in the academia. It has got deep pockets, it has got supporters, and it uh, works it to its advantage. And uh, here you have a situation where the white actually gets left out in the United States. And um, then there are some parts of it, uh, they actually, all the three of them collaborate in, the, in, in, in India. But in India, of course, we have a different situation. We are still able to speak our mind. I don't know how long we'll be able to do it, but uh, certainly we are able to speak our mind also because of the uh, basic ethos of plurality of the uh, majority over there. So uh, once again, I come to that. Unless you go to the fundamentals, unless there is a courageous leadership within the United States that looks at these fundamentals, then uh, I fear not just the United States, not just the free world, the very future of democracy is doomed in this world. You are so right. I Yeah, I, I, I get that same sinister feeling many times. And I do feel that India probably has some hope, you know, just given that we we don't follow the, you know, larger ecosystems as much. So, but uh, but coming to you, Vibhuti ji, uh, if you can touch upon some of those, you know, uh, I mean, the fact that the civilizational construct, you know, is, is for them a threat, uh, like what, Hindu, maybe Hindutva is, you know, or, or yesterday, Dr. Richard Benkin, a Jewish uh, a gentleman was explaining to me what Zionism is, you know, so basically, civilization in itself largely exists in museums, except for some of us. And um, does that perpetrate a threat for them? And any other thoughts from the previous question? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, look at this, we have survived. True, we have survived. We have survived because we have got truncated, because we have lost out a lot of land. Gandhar is gone to Kandahar. You know, Buddha's Bamiya has gone to the Ox, right? We have lost our Bay of Bengal, the Bengal tiger to Bangladesh uh, <laughs> Bay, Bay there. And our Indus River is no longer ours. So think about it from that perspective, just the three references here, not about many others. The Akhanda Bharat doesn't exist anymore. So we have survived, but at a pretty precious cost of it. The important part is that as Sanjay Ji is absolutely right, that if the democracies do not rise up, we are facing an existential threat. We are in denial. Now, you have to go back to the previous question that you said, are we going to survive or the fear against us is what? So 
as I have believed, and I will reiterate that my thought, is the Abrahamic religions, the organized religion, which I sometimes disparagingly call organized mafia, it operates on the basis of fear and ignorance. It's totally driven on fear and ignorance. They talk about heaven and hell. They issue the passport and visas to you and I, that if you do this, you will go to heaven. If you don't do this, you will go to hell. Hey, my simple question as a Punjabi friend used to tell me, Vibhuti ji, <laughs> Who has experienced heaven and hell? We have to begin to ask these questions as an inquiry. We have to begin to demand reciprocity from those who, uh, who oppose us. Ask evidence for whatever they are accusing us of. So what is happening right now, if you think, in my opinion, I have shared this many times, is that the world is recognizing that the science and advancements in science and technology has brought about tectonic shifts in which we did things or we do things, right? We know now that thunder and lightning doesn't happen because gods are angry. The, the, the entire Middle East is a desert area is not because God punished Muslims of that land and gave them uh, sand and an oil to drink, right? He's not punishing Japanese for with earthquakes because they are some evil form. This is, this, is to, this is geography. This is nature. What is happening is the science and technology is removing the misconceptions and ignorance, which is what Kanatan principle is all about. It's all about nature. It's about science. It has scientific base to everything. When we talk about, in my opinion, again, Vasudev Kutumkam is not that the world is a family. Because family is a highly discordant unit. Brothers fight with brothers, sisters fight with sisters for ancestral property and whatever else, you know? That's why it is called sibling rivalry. But the concept of the Vasudev Kutumkam is, in my opinion, Dharti Mata is one. It's Earth's resources that we consume. It is the same sun that sustains us. It's the same air that sustains us. It's the same water that sustains us. How far does any God change that equation? The question to be asked is that when Taliban guy says, women have no place in our government, they are there only because they have to be. The question here is that how can a country be prosperous? How the West and democracies accept the Taliban or the Sharia way of women's rights? I mean, Saudi Arabia gave women driving right and that was a global story. But the fact that Shiv and Parvati are original examples of gender equality in our faith, nobody knows. So we have to also reflect internally that we haven't taught people about this. We haven't propagated this message to the world around us. So while they treat their celebrities who convert to Islam with absolutely hero worship, we don't even bother about it. Julia Roberts and so many others who embrace Hindu philosophy, you know, they talk about Bhagavad Gita, you know, that one actor, I don't want to name name here, but one actor said my entire enlightenment came because of Bhagavad Gita. We don't talk about that. We don't celebrate their embrace of Hindu philosophy. You know, that's what the important part is. We have to take our corrective steps. And I tell you, our evil, the ones who want to destroy us, they are preparing for long and they realize this. That if these blokes are not controlled now, they will rule us because science has advanced. Coronavirus proved it. Coronavirus proved it. It didn't discriminate between men and women, young and old, rich and poor, black and white, Japanese or Colombian. It did not. And all the godmen who were trying to preach that pray to this, it will save your life. They're all hiding in their caves or den wherever they belong to. That's the point which I'm trying to make. They fear us. They fear us. And that's why the attack on us. The, 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 the sad part is only one, that when Ambani and Ananda Mahindras, their centers, the sponsors global Hindutva, that's the sad part. Civilizations don't die because somebody beats them. Civilization dies only when they get corroded from within. So I tweeted today to Anand Mahindra and Reliance Industries that your fortune and your billions and your empire 
is made up of blood, uh, blood, sweat, and tears of many Hindus. You must apologize or pull out your support to this. We have to begin to voice ourselves. Technology gives us anonymity and an ability to convey a thought. But for technology, we won't be talking here. Talking here. In India midnight at midnight won't be watching us. Sanjay ji also must be very tired. So I will Sanjay ji, but you must answer <laughs> one more question. <laughs> I think we, uh, my question is actually, um, uh, you know, just going back to, you were talking about how STEM can support us. And I think that needs a little bit more, um, you know, uh, just elaboration because I, we would like to know that what you would, um, hinting at and also the a new education policy you know some of the thoughts that Vibhutiji just mentioned do you think that will bring about some Indic renaissance in our uh, education material mm, so those two questions yeah on that actually I wrote up uh, what is called a little booklet it's called all religions are not the same very politically incorrect but it is completely based on science because uh, I borrowed a lot from Dr. C.K. Raju on this and uh, he bases entire philosophy on the, what is called what he calls time beliefs and uh, according to him that time is the mediator between science and religion and uh, that is also a mediator between that time and religion. And there you have three kinds of religions here who are actually attacking us. I call communism also a religion because it is also based in a dogma. And it has a book and it has, uh, well, at least one prophet for sure. And maybe some small semi prophets as well. So, uh, if you read that little booklet, uh, now I have basically distinguished uh, uh, everything on the basis of science. And I have uh, actually questioned the Western universalism, what they claim as their superior technology. And uh, I have also said in that, that uh, the basic problem with the West is that they did not change. They did not change when science changed. I'm talking about fundamental sciences, of course. I'm not talking about STEM, not as such as STEM. I'm talking about the, the basic theories. So the basic theories changed. The social sciences did not change. And that was taken advantage of by the cunning, and especially by the left. And uh, you see all that happening, you know, after the, the beginning of uh, postmodernism, just immediately after quantum mechanics in the 1930s. So uh, you have cultural Marxism coming there, you have postmodernism coming there, and uh, uh, of course that finally degenerates into the uh, woke philosophies of today. And you have all the radicalism, you have uh, rules for radicals being formulated, but uh, no pushback at all. And after all, if you're really caring for Western universalism, Western values, and you think democracy is the best thing that could happen to the world, then uh, it was incumbent upon you to diagnose those tendencies, which would ultimately subvert the democracies from within. Ultimately, as uh, Vibhuti ji rightly said, that uh, civilizations die because they convert from within. And uh, democracies will die because they will be corroded from within. <laughs> because they will be subverted from within. I mean, I still remember, I think it's one of the best quips that I've heard that, uh, well, you use the uh, Hamid Gul of Pakistan, is that we use the American money to defeat yeah. the Russians. And now we will use the American money to defeat the Americans. And that's exactly what they did. And the Americans are sitting here, and I don't know what they are preening themselves uh, for what. They are made to look stupid you must admit they are stupid if they do not admit they are stupid then they will repeat this again that's right so, so but the, you have to go to the fundamentals and you 
at least in the United States, because the United States still has that uh, culture of deep analysis, that uh, we need to find people who will tackle these spurious theories, uh, which are not being talked about. Of course, I was very happy to note that the uh, scientist at the time of the Trump election was happening. The scientists withdrew uh, support. A lot of scientists withdrew support from the kind of absurdities that the Democrats were uh, going about doing. I mean, everything is a dogma. Feminism is a dogma. <laughs> uh, so, uh, BLM has become a dogma. Democracies cannot survive without objectivity. Uh, if democracy only means pandering to certain groups, then I'm sorry, then we can only say that, okay, that uh, the democracy of the people, by the people, for the people is dead. And now in the United States, we have a democracy of the donors, by the donors, and for the donors. Thank you so much, uh, Sanjayji. And, uh, you know, I, um, I, was, I was just going to um, point to the fact, I know I was going to say one more thing, but I forgot now. But uh, one of the points that uh, Pibutiji, you brought up about was, uh, uh, you know, about the, just, just the Hollywood actors and all, you know. So the fact is that not only them, but there's a wide variety of people who, after they reach a certain, you know, level of accomplishments, they come to the Hindu traditions, or at least, you know, one of our Sanatani traditions for their um, spiritual solace. So that is definitely a trend. And also the European enlightenment and transcendentalism in the United States we're all driven by the Bhagavad Gita principles, you know. I think they have acknowledged that in the past, but nowadays, of course, the narrative is being spun in very different directions. Um, I think I will take uh, just a minute of closing comments because we do have our next session coming up. We are a little bit running behind, but um, thank you so much. This was a wonderful discourse, discussion. I loved it. <laughs> Vibhutiji, I'll give you the last minute. Oh, you give me the last minute. Thank you very much. But the, the important part here is the West is embracing of our ideas. And I go back to 1983, September or October, was it? When, I'm, when a very popular, very famous management consultant was addressing Bankers Club in, our, in Bangalore. And he said that by the, towards the end of 19, 1990s or beginning of 2000, these are his statements in 1983. America will embrace Hindu philosophy, our yoga, meditation, and everything else. Because they are very stressed out people. Now, stress was a word I didn't even know at that time existed. Only thing that I knew in Bombay, they used to say tension lene ka nahi, dene ka hai. <laughs> so I, I knew about that. But stress as a word, I never knew as a part of our being because we realize now what a stressful life we left there. It was part of our being. You know, you write an exam, 100,000 people write an exam to get a good job. It is a stressful life. So the question here is, he said that, that it will happen because they're very stressed out. My suggestion to everybody is begin to talk about it to people, our own faith and belief. Let's not, let's not be self-satisfied, contented. Because if you do not tell the world what you are and what you do, why would anybody care to know about you? And when they care to know about you, then they care to know about it from their narrative perspective. And then we begin to complain, oh, hum to waise nahi hai. They, are, they are the stupid people don't understand it. So we have to begin to you know, control the educative, na education narrative of our Sanatan principles and the way we are. You know. It's, uh, it's like, uh, you know, remember one thing, the leftists have very effectively co-opted the progressive movement in the name of peaceful coexistence. Right. About, right? And they're violent about their <laughs> peaceful coexistence. So we have to begin to question these fundamentals. And if we don't raise our voice, why do we blame anyone? And it's for you and I. So, Sanjayji mentioned about you know, the, the, the thing that, uh, no, that was a very nice word he used and I forgot to mention, renaissance part of it. He used the word renaissance. And I always say every Hindu needs to become a renaissance man. With these yeah. words, I end. Thank you very much.
That was beautiful. But I do want to throw a thought out also. It's a, it's a little bit serious, something that I've noticed in this society, like the Hindus withdrew for a long time within their, you know, selves, you know, and now we're sort of expressing ourselves and we have built a little bit of our Kshatriya sense. In the United States, I'm seeing the, you know, larger population withdrawing. They're homeschooling their children because they don't agree with the policies that identity politics that is entering. And so it is, a, it, these are unusual times. Institutionally, there is a corrosion happening from this left Islamist group. And that is something to think about how we are going to, um, you know, decolonize from that within India. And I'm sure America will need to do that soon if it has to survive within its, um, you know, exceptional uh, glory that it claims to have. So with those uh, sobering thoughts, I loved this discussion as usual, it was so, so profound. And thank you very much for uh, being, being here and Sanjiji, uh, thank you, yeah, thank thank you, you so for much. being here for uh, it's so late in the night. Thank you.